Hello everyone. So um, now that we've talked about um, you know social cognition and the kind of basic um, fundamental aspects of social cognition, now we're going to talk a little bit more about applying some of those concepts to understanding um, some of the more uh, complex uh, phenomena in, in social reality or you know, social psychology. So uh, first we're going to talk about uh, the idea of memory as a reconstructive process. Um, next we're going to talk about how we can apply these concepts to uh, understanding the behavior of others. Um, and then uh, finally we're going to talk about impression formation and you know how we come to understand uh, uh, others, uh, their personality or their demographics or what have you. Okay. So, um, as we discussed earlier, uh, perception is not a completely objective, reliable, and you know trustworthy process. Uh, you know, it doesn't give us a perfect um, understanding of the material world around us. And so, if the point at which we collect information um, is not trustworthy, uh, we might also ask, is our recollection of that information objective, reliable, and trustworthy? Is our memory, you know, objective? Um, and the short answer is, of course, no. And, you know, hopefully you were uh, anticipating that at this point. Hopefully uh, I drove that point home hard enough in the first lecture. So similar to perception, uh, memory is subject to a variety of pitfalls and vi uh, biases that, you know, make it fail in, in recognizable, predictable, systematic ways. Um, memory is actually thought of rather as like recalling something directly and specifically. It's, it's thought of more of a reconstructive process. Um, and so the, the quote in the textbook is that it's uh, not so much like reading a book as it is like writing one from fragmentary notes. Um, and you know another way that i've thought of it is like uh, a detective coming into a, a crime scene and attempting to recreate the events of the crime in her mind right it's obviously not a perfect um uh, a perfect representation of what happened it's it's more of a um kind of an amalgam or a creation or a dramatization almost of, of what happened so just so we're all kind of on the same page with regards to memory, um, we're going to do a quick crash course in memory. I don't actually know if you've learned memory yet or, you know, to what extent you've learned memory. So I'm just going to give you a little kind of a, a brief run through of it. So you're probably familiar with these two terms, but um, many theorists, uh, not all theorists, that you can look into that if you're interested. Um, but many theorists consider memory to be uh, consisting of two separate systems, the short-term memory, which is information that's um, currently activated and immediately available to us, uh, and the long-term memory, which is information from uh, past experiences that's not currently available to us, but it's potentially available for retrieval. Um, but it's, it's not currently uh, activated. And then um, memory takes place over the, the process of, of creating something for memory takes place over a few steps. Um, so first we encode some information from our environment into our short term memory. So that's the encoding step. Um, and then next, some of that information in our short term memory will be consolidated into our long term memory. Uh, that's the consolidation step. And then finally, uh, later on, information from our long-term memory can be retrieved, and this is the retrieval step. Um, and so at each of these steps, the encoding, consolidation, and retrieval, um, each of these steps are subject to different errors. So uh, for example, your class might classmate might tell you her name, um, but if you're not paying attention because you're, I don't know, thinking about exams or a video game you want to play or something you might not encode that name correctly it might just not really make its way you know all the way to your brain basically so it might not get into the uh, short-term memory but even if you do encode it correctly uh, something might interrupt the process of consolidating it from short-term memory into 
uh, uh, into long-term memory. Um, so it never makes its way there. And that's the feeling of like, oh, she did, you know, she definitely told me her name, but oh, there's no way I can remember it. I knew she told me, but I, I, I'm not going to be able to remember it. Um, but if it does make it to long-term memory, if you do successfully consolidate it, you still won't necessarily be able to quickly and correctly retrieve it. Um, and all of us are probably familiar with this uh, frustrating experience. Um, you know, one, one form of it is referred to as the tip of the tongue phenomenon, right? Um, but sometimes you know something is in your memory, but you simply cannot retrieve it. Um, and uh, an interesting sort of illustration of this phenomenon is that sometimes you need a context clue uh, in order to retrieve a particular piece of information like oh her name started with an s uh, and then you're able to say like yes you know sophie or whatever um, or she sat right behind you in the lecture hall in the you know uh, whatever particular vari hall lecture hall or whatever like even these sorts of context clues could give you enough uh, contextual information um, to, to sort of find where you filed that piece of information away in long-term memory, and then you can get it. Um, but uh, uh, just because it made its way into long-term memory doesn't mean you'll always necessarily be able to retrieve it. And so after watching the last lecture, it may not surprise you that um, this information that we encode, consolidate, and retrieve is also dependent on schemata. Um, so uh, uh, like knowledge, memory is also built on schemata. So, um, as you'd probably guess, um, the way that this works is schemata dictate how we can recall information. And generally speaking, we'll talk about it, but generally speaking, information that is schema consistent is going to be easier to recall than schema inconsistent information. Um, so uh, in one study, for example, uh, subjects were shown an interview with a woman um, and they were told either that she was a waitress or that she was a librarian. And so then in the interview, um, the woman says that she likes beer and classical music. And so the subjects who were told that she was a waitress did a better job remembering that she liked beer. But the subjects uh, who were told that she was a librarian did a better job remembering that she liked classical music. Um, and this is, of course, because in each case, the information that they recall is more consistent with the schema that they had for the woman. Um, hopefully that's clear uh, after all the sort of discussion of schema that we had. But um, a, a sort of interesting case is schema inconsistent information. So uh, typically speaking, schema inconsistent information is is harder to recall um and you know this is basically for the reasons that i just gave but the opposite which is that like uh memory is guided by schema um it the information that's consistent with our schema are uh, easier to um, access because that's the information that we paid the most attention to at the time, as we discussed in the last, last lecture. And then it's also the information that, given the schema that we can access, it's, it, it's sort of easier to find that file, right? Um, the exception to this rule is that um, information that's highly inconsistent with your schema will actually be uh, very easy to remember. Um, so the, the kind of fun example I think that the textbook gives uh, is the idea of being at a funeral and then someone gets up onto the coffin and starts uh, tap dancing on it. Um, you know, if you saw that happen, you'd probably never forget it. And it's because it's so inconsistent with your schema of how a funeral should go. Um, and then the, um, uh, the, the, the example that I always think of is, um, you know, I don't know if you, uh, you have all had this experience, but in, in high school, um, if the teacher ever said a curse word, <laughs> you kind of never forgot it because, you know, your high school teachers typically don't curse. And so if you can kind of goad one of them into cursing one day, often, uh, kind of the whole class remembers it and maybe mentions it uh, occasionally uh, for the rest of the year. Um, so yeah, it's, it's when things are so unusual, so inconsistent with the schema that it becomes more memorable. Um, so uh, uh, it, it's worth noting that as before, you can sort of overcome this uh, bias or this kind of like 
pattern, this tendency. Um, schema consistent information is easier to recall when um, we're less motivated and we have fewer cognitive resources. Um, uh, basically, if we're not trying too hard, um, we'll kind of automatically get the schema consistent information. Um, but if we're highly motivated to detect schema inconsistent information, um, and we have the cognitive resources available to do so, then in those cases, um, you know, we'll probably do a better job at recalling some of that information that was inconsistent with our schema. So uh, if memory is so unreliable, uh, can it be in intentionally you know, manipulated um, by oneself or others? Um, and you know, if you've seen the pattern yet of me asking these leading questions, then you know, of course, the answer is going to be uh, yes. Um, in fact, memories can be uh, manipulated, like massage, sort of generally altered. They can be implanted. You can stick little sort of bits of memories into other memories. Um, or they can be fabricated entirely, a terrifying thought. <laughs> um, so one psychologist is particularly well known for her contributions on this topic. Uh, some of you may know her name, uh, Elizabeth Loftus. So she spent her career basically studying varieties of this concept, uh, broadly referred to as the misinformation effect. Um, and this is the tendency for incorrect information to worm its way into our memories. And, you know, sometimes it's just a slight alteration of a true memory. Sometimes it's the injection of something novel into a true memory. And other times um, it's a memory that never took place at all. And it's, you know, created out of, out of uh, nothing. So um, uh, in one set of studies, um, uh, subjects were shown a video of a car accident, one car hitting another. Um, and then after watching the video, some of the participants were asked uh, how, fast, uh, how fast was the car going when it hit the other car. Um, and then the other participants were asked um, how fast was the car going when it smashed into the car. Um, and so participants who were cued with smashed estimated that the car was actually going faster than the, 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 the participants who were cued with just hit. Um, and the really kind of fun bit here is that the participant participants, um, who, uh, were cued with this word smashed, uh, were actually twice as likely to recall broken glass at the scene in the video, even though there was no broken glass. Um, and uh, uh, so that's, you know, sort of a memory being kind of massaged gently, but still resulting in pretty distinct uh, alterations of the memory. Um, but she's actually shown that um, you can kind of reliably implant false memories into people. Um, so in particular, she has these, I think, a handful of studies where She's shown that you can create the memory of being lost in a mall as a child uh, in people. And, you know, in this memory at the end, you're found by some elderly benefactor person um, who, you know, helps to reunite you with your family. Um, and this shows that, you know, she's able to replicate this several times. And this shows that childhood memories can be implanted in adults if you sort of have enough suggestion if you if you do a kind of a thorough enough job at um uh at suggesting uh these memories to people um and you know this is very important uh the, the, this trend is kind of dying a little bit but it's it's definitely been around for the past three-ish decades um but the idea of using psychotherapy to unearth repressed memories. Um, hopefully you've heard of this before. Actually, kind of hopefully you haven't because I'm kind of hoping it dies because um, it's a very dangerous and um, uh, damaging <laughs> concept. Um, but you've probably heard about them in media because they're pretty sensationalized in media and in the news. The idea that you can go to psychotherapy, maybe receive some sort of hypnosis, maybe not, but that a psychotherapist can help kind of dig through your uh, uh, quote unquote subconscious and help you unearth uh, memories that have been repressed in some way. And typically, as you know, if you've heard of this, um, it's repressed memories of childhood trauma or sexual abuse these sorts of things and often this results in the uh, accusation of a parent or other adult uh, uh, loved one often of sexual abuse 
Um, and it turns out um, through, uh, you know, study by Elizabeth Loftus and many other people that broadly speaking, these so-called repressed, uncovered repressed memories cannot actually be trusted, even if they're about these extremely serious and dire topics of, of childhood trauma and sexual abuse. And I'm not saying that, of course, I'm not saying they've never been true. And I'm not saying that no one has experienced childhood trauma or sexual abuse. Of course, that that's that would be ridiculous to suggest. Uh, but this idea that, you know, a psychologist can reliably unearth um, these memories in you is, uh, unfortunately, has been shown to be largely uh, untrue, um, or at the very least, highly dubitable. <laughs> um, so um, this is a super interesting topic, or at least I find it really fascinating. There are documentaries out there. You can seek them out if you like. Um, there might even be other courses that cover this in, in more detail. I myself, when I was in my undergrad, was lucky enough to take a seminar that covered this topic in, um, in great detail. And uh, yeah, it's a fascinating and kind of twisted and upsetting topic. Um, so yeah, if you're interested in more, I would recommend looking into it. Um, in particular, you, you might want to look into uh, what's called the Satanic Panic. Um, that's, a, that's a good little uh, Google Wikipedia hole you can fall into today if you, uh, <laughs> if you feel like wasting some time. Sorry, uh, one uh, just final note about um, this repressed memories topic now that I've brought it up and spoken about it at length. Um, uh, it, it's worth noting that um, the people who were doing this, who, who found to be um, sort of uh, uh, engaging in this, the psychotherapists, um, uh, they were profiting quite a bit from this activity, and they were also, um, coincidentally perhaps, you know, perhaps uncoincidentally, uh, finding repressed memories of sexual childhood abuse in all of their patients, right? Um, and that seems like a strange pattern. You wouldn't expect that in every single patient, but the people who are known for doing this kept finding them in all of their patients. And so, you know, again, you should look into this if you're interested. Um, but, uh, it's worth pointing out. I think that the patients of these psychotherapists are actually victims. Um, they're, they're victims of, you know, intense kind of or at least potentially victims of intense psychological abuse by their psychotherapists, right? Uh, um, th these people are um, being damaged in some way by their psychotherapists. So, sorry, I, I talked about this topic more than I actually intended to, but um, once I brought it up, it was important that I uh, sort of spoke on it thoroughly so that I didn't misrepresent the topic or, or treat it with a little, you know, too much levity. Um, so, yeah, okay, putting that aside. All right. Um, and from from that frying pan now into a different fire, um, uh, the misinformation effect is also very important for the law, as you can imagine. Um, so, for example, eyewitness testimonies um, are uh, highly susceptible to this misinformation effect. Um, there's plenty of information on this, so you know, look at, uh, seek it out. Maybe take psych in the law. They probably covered in that course, um, but. You know, if if someone is repeating their eyewitness testimony over and over again, and each time you're kind of leading out different aspects of it, you're kind of uh, um, uh, asking leading questions or whatever, um, you can alter and manipulate it over the course of repeated recall, leading your eyewitness to become um, more confident maybe in their hazy memories or to recall details that weren't necessarily present in the original recall. There are documented instances of this happening. Um, so yeah, I mean it's it's uh, frightening, um, but uh, you know it's a real it's a real sort of problem that exists uh, in, in in eyewitness testimony. Uh, and similarly, um, there have been many documented real life cases where false memories of crimes of committing a crime can be implanted in a person, and then you can get them to produce a false confession. Uh, again, terrifying, interesting strange, um, worth looking into more, probably worth taking the psych and law course and discussing it more thoroughly, or, uh, you know, maybe looking up a documentary or something, but, uh, yeah, that's enough on the misinformation fact for now. So, um, now that we have a basic understanding of memory and the related processes, we can move on to, uh, another fundamental social cognitive process, which is, um, inferring 
uh, cause and effect in the world, the, the etiology of the world, understanding how things affect each other. Um, and, you know, this process is particularly difficult when it comes to humans, and <laughs> you probably have all figured that out by now, uh, by this point in your lives. Um, and it's largely because humans' intention is invisible, right? Um, to infer the reasons for another person's uh, behavior or emotion or whatever, um, we make what's called causal attributions, right? So if someone, uh, if you text your friend and she doesn't respond to you, you have to make a causal attribution about why she's not responding to you. Is she ignoring you? Is she busy? You know, did she, did she forget? Is she mad at you? Um, and believe it or not, these causal attributions actually have, uh, implications for matters that are, uh, more important than getting ghosted by your friend. Um, like a jury evaluating whether someone, uh, killed someone else in self-defense or out of bloodthirst, right? Um, so causal attributions are uh, incredibly important for psychologists and just for humans, uh, in, in everyday, uh, <laughs> life. Um, so causal attributions, uh, typically take one of two forms. Um, and, uh, this is in, uh, the context of their locus of causality. So they either have an internal locus of causality, and that means that you're inferring some, inferring something about the person themselves. So if your friend doesn't text you back, it's because she's mad at you. That's something internal to her, right? Um, or the attribution has uh, an external locus of causality. Um, and this is when you're inferring um, something about the environment. So when your friend doesn't text you back, it's because her phone is dead. That's external to her. It's, an, it's something in the environment causing the behavior. Um, and then the other uh, dimension on which causal attributions vary is uh, stability. So this relates to whether you think the factor determining that behavior is going to change in the future, is likely to change in the future. So, for example, um, if your friend is just um, mad at you, uh, uh, like, today, you know, she's just pissed with you today, and that's why she's not texting you back um, that's instable. Um, and if your friend isn't texting you back, um, because she actually finds you annoying now, she doesn't really want to be friends anymore in the future. She's probably not going to text you back very often in the future anymore. That's a stable, uh, that's a stable factor affecting her, her behavior. So, um, we can, uh, also combine these two dimensions in order to better understand the form of a causal attribution. Um, so if you'll, uh, look at my nice table here, um, uh, if your friend, uh, doesn't text you back, um, because she no longer likes you and she doesn't want to be friends, that is a stable and internal, um, attribution. It's unlikely to change in the future and you're making an attribution about her, uh, and her personality it's something about her, right? Um, if you're making an internal uh, attribution, um, but it's instable, um, then that might be like, she's mad at me today, but she'll be over it by tomorrow. She'll text me back tomorrow because it's something about internal to her, but um, it's, uh, it's likely to change in the future. If you uh, make the attribution that uh, her phone is dead and that's why she's not texting me back, um, but it's always dead, She's so bad at keeping it charged. She doesn't plug it in overnight, so her phone is dying every day. So she's likely to keep me waiting on texting in the future. That's an external uh, attribution that is stable in nature. This is because you're making an external attribution. You think it's something in the environment causing it, but it's unlikely to change in the future. It's a relatively stable factor. Um, and then uh, finally, if you um, uh, think that, you know, uh, normally she keeps her phone charged, but you know, this time her, maybe your cat chewed her wire. And so now she doesn't have a wire anymore and she can't charge her phone anymore. And it's dead or something like this would be an external instable attribution because you're making an attribution about, uh, the environment, something in the environment caused the behavior. Um, but it will change in the future. It's just temporary. Um, so this is, you know, instable. So 
it's worth noting that I'm not telling you these terms for no reason, that they're actually important um, uh, for, for, for causal attributions. Um, internal, external, stable, unstable. These attributions all have different implications for, for, for different people. So, you know, for example, if our friend did just have her phone die one time and didn't text us back, we probably wouldn't be too upset with her, right? Like this is a, this is a single occurrence. It's, it's understandable. It kind of happens to us all at one point or another. Um, but you know, that friend whose phone's always dead or always dying, you might get a little irritated with her for not texting you back, right? Like you might get a little, it's an, it's annoying, right? Um, so these are, uh, these have different kind of implications for your relationship. Um, similarly, if a friend doesn't text you back one day because she's mad at you, probably not a big deal. You guys will both get over it. Um, but you'll feel very differently if you think that she just doesn't like you anymore and doesn't plan on texting you often in the future uh, at all. Um, so, you know, all of these attributions will lead you to very different places and lead to very different relationships. Um, you'll make, based on these attributions, you'll make different predictions for the future, for her behavior, for your behavior, for your guys' relationships, you know, depending on the attribution you make. So hopefully that's a little bit clear uh, as to why these two dimensions are important. And, you know, hopefully I've uh, adequately explained the different dimensions to you as well. Um, so now that I've explained the attributions to you a little bit, um, you might ask, how do we make these causal attributions? Uh, and the answer is we make them quickly. We make them intuitively, we make them automatically uh, without really much conscious effort or rationale. Um, so uh, for example, uh, if your mom makes coffee every morning and then one day, uh, I don't know, your friend is over the, at breakfast or something and says like, hey, why does your mom make, uh, why is your mom doing that? Why is she making coffee? You'd probably say, she always does that or she likes drinking coffee in the morning, right? Um, you probably haven't thought about it much because it's an everyday regular occurrence that readily fits your schema about the morning. Um, but if you found her making a uh, martini in the morning, <laughs> you would probably spend some effort trying to figure out why she was doing that. Um, so uh, events that are um, unexpected uh, or are very important, um, are likely to uh, elicit um, more uh, conscious uh, causal attributions. So uh, returning to schemata, um, uh, when we make attributions for uh, behaviors that are um, consistent with our schema, um, then those are the ones that tend to be automatic or intuitive. Um, you probably don't need to expend much effort or thought, um, f like asking yourself, uh, you know, why is he going to the bathroom or why is she getting into bed? You understand the most likely reasons for both of these behaviors. Um, and you, you know, probably don't have to think about them at all. Um, uh, on the other hand, our attributions tend to be more uh, effortful and conscious um, when the behaviors that we're making them for are surprising uh, or important. Um, so if they're inconsistent with the schema or if you're highly motivated to understand them, those are the ones that are going to elicit the effortful conscious uh, attributions. Uh, so for example, um, if you saw your brother eating staples, you would probably wonder, uh, why is he eating staples? This is because it's very schema inconsistent. It's surprising. It's strange. It kind of knocks you out of it and makes you, uh, <laughs> forces you to wonder about it. Right. Um, this isn't as strange or as surprising. Um, but if your boss says to you during your shift, like, uh, Hey, uh, you know, we need to, we need to talk after work. Like you need to come meet me after work. Um, that could be very important. Um, and so you'll probably spend the rest of your shift trying to figure out what it is that he wants um, because it is an important uh, event. And so the attribution there is going to be very effortful, very conscious. So that now that we know what types of attributions can be made, um, we can talk about when uh, they're going to be made, when the different types are made. Um, well, it, it turns out that humans, uh, for better or for worse, 
um, have a very strong tendency to make internal attributions about other people. So remember, these are uh, attributions about the um, personality or desire or beliefs or knowledge about other people, something internal to other people. Um, so this tendency is referred to as the uh, correspondent inference, uh, the tendency for humans to attribute the behaviors of others to a trait, attitude, or desire of another person. Um, so people tend to make internal attributions, right? Um, and these attributions are uh, most likely to happen um, when the actor seems to have a choice and they choose that particular line of action. Um, so for example, uh, if you're standing in line at like a burrito shop and the person in front of you orders the spicy burrito, um, when there are non-spicy options, you would assume that she, uh, likes spicy food. You would make that attribution about her, um, because she had a choice and she chose that one. Um, uh, the the internal this correspondent inference is also more likely when um, there's only a, a key difference like one key difference between the choices um, so <clears throat> in the burrito example the main difference is like spicy versus uh, mild or non-spicy whatever um, and that's the only difference and she chose spicy so you would make this inference that you know she likes uh, uh, spicy food um, and then finally, uh, <clears throat> it's most likely when uh, the behavior is inconsistent with the social role. Um, so trying to stick here to the burrito example, um, if a person, you know, if she sent her burrito back and asked for like even more spice, even more like hot sauce on it, um, that would be kind of inconsistent with uh, how things typically uh, work socially. You know, you, you usually don't send your food back to uh, to get more spice on it. So that must mean she really loves spicy food. She really wants the sort of the, the kick in it, right? Um, uh, yeah, so um, just returning for a second uh, to, to item one here, just in case I didn't hit it hard enough. Um, if someone didn't have a choice, you know, if there was only one burrito on the menu and it was spicy and the, you know, the, the woman in front of you ordered a spicy burrito, you probably wouldn't make that same inference because it's the only thing that she can order. Right. Um, so in those cases, you, you, you wouldn't, uh, you wouldn't be as likely to make the correspondent inference. Um, the person has to have sort of a range of options that they can choose and they have to sort of volitionally of their own seemingly of their own um desire make that choice now i say most likely uh because it turns out uh <laughs> regardless of these principles that i've just presented these are tendency principles meaning they make the correspondent inference more likely um but the truth is that humans are likely to make these internal attributions no matter what uh it turns out we can barely stop ourselves from doing it uh it is uh, absolutely in our nature to make these even when it's inappropriate to do so um we actually underestimate the uh the effect of external factors for other people's behaviors um and we over emphasize the extent to which uh, the internal or dispositional factors um, affect their behavior. Uh, dispositional, like internal or dispositional, again, just refers to these ideas that it's something about the person. Dispositional might mean mood, something like that, but the point is that internal or dispositional refer to the idea that it's something internal to that person, right? Um, so this error that we seem to make, this this uh, kind of difficult to um, mitigate or difficult to stop tendency to make these internal attributions. This is what's called the fundamental attribution error. Um, it's how we tend to overestimate the effect of internal factors uh, for other people and underestimate the external factors for other people. Um, crucially, we do not do this on ourselves. Uh, we don't overestimate uh, the extent to which our behavior is uh, influenced by our personality, and we don't uh, overestimate, um, sorry, <laughs> um, we do not overestimate the uh, influence of personality on our behaviors, and we do not underestimate the effect of external uh, factors on our own behaviors. Uh, this is only true for when you're judging other people. 
So, um, you know, for example, in one study that demonstrates this fundamental attribution error, um, participants read an essay that uh, was either strongly in favor of Fidel Castro or it was strongly against Fidel Castro. So participants were either told that the author uh, chose his position or it was assigned to him. So this is, there, there are four conditions here, right? Um, strongly for or strongly against author chose his position or it was assigned to him. And what the uh, researchers found was that the participants who rated the author uh, assigned the pro Castro position. Uh, they rated him as having a similar level of true pro Castro attitude to the author who chose his position. So just to really point that home, there are two authors, both wrote, wrote pro Castro and the, uh, one person chose to write a pro Castro. The other person was forced to write pro Castro. Participants rated them as being similarly pro Castro. Um, so in other words, we're actually not very good at make uh, knowing when to make these internal uh, attributions. And this is what the fundamental attribution error is meant to illustrate. We kind of do it automatically. We can't really help ourselves. Uh, the other example that I always think of is, you know, we're driving on the highway and someone cuts us off you know we probably yell some expletive at them we you know punch our steering wheel or whatever and we probably think that person is an asshole we probably think that's that's a that's a bad person that's an asshole and that's why they cut me off right um but you know that person probably has a reason to have cut you off to be rushing. Um, you know, maybe there's a pregnant person in the car or they're rushing to the hospital or who knows, right? Um, but if you cut someone off and, you know, if you've been driving a while, you probably have cut someone off before intentionally or accidentally. You probably don't think of yourself in as, as an asshole. You probably think of the external factors, the environmental factors that lead you to do that. Um, it's just sort of a one-time thing, right? So this is what, again, this is meant to illustrate the fundamental attribution error. It's our, our sort of inimitable tendency to make these internal attributions. Uh, one final note about this fundamental attribution error. It's worth noting um, uh, that it's it, it's culturally contingent. Um, you know, I wish uh, I wish I could make time to talk about the cultural contingencies of all these effects, but uh, there's already a lot of material and uh, that's a, I mean, cultural psychology is literally another course. Um, but uh, in this case, uh, it's worth no noting that um, the fundamental attribution error is much less strong among those in collectivistic cultures. Uh, so as you may recall, these are um, tribal or uh, um, East Asian or um, African, uh, I'll, I'll tend to be more collectivistic uh, cultures. Um, but even in the West, uh, the fundamental attribution error is actually lower among low socioeconomic status people in like in individualistic cultures. So um, obviously the extent to which uh, this this effect appears in different cultural snippets um, differs, and so maybe it's not as fundamental an error as we once thought as psychologists. Just something to chew on. It's still an important and definitely real concept. It's just maybe not as sort of universally human as we uh, perhaps once believed. Um, so, of course, uh, we don't always make these internal or dispositional attributions. Um, so it's worth uh, talking about when we do make these other situational, like external attributions. Um, so when we're under cognitive load, uh, we're more likely to make uh, 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 internal or dispositional attributions. Cognitive load, in case you haven't encountered this term before, refers to cases where we have low cognitive resources. Um, sometimes this is done in studies by making someone like count backwards by eight from a hundred or something like that. There are lots of ways that you can kind of increase cognitive load, reduce cognitive resources. Um, and it happens in real life when you're distracted or you're tired or you're stressed or whatever. Um, you could probably imagine what this feels like. <laughs> Um, so, uh, when you do have, uh, sufficient cognitive resources and you're motivated to do so, you can basically, um, leap from that initial 
correspondent inference that you made, the the the, the internal attribution that you made um, into making a situational attribution. Um, so you sort of start off kind of with that impulse that everyone has to make the kind of internal attribution, but you, you jump to a situational one. Um, so an interesting study that they talk about in the textbook, or at least, you know, I think it's interesting is that, um, uh, liberals are less likely than conservatives to see AIDS patients as being irresponsible, um, you know, for, for having, contracted uh, HIV um, and this is because liberals are sort of broadly speaking motivated to see how uh, external factors in the world might have impacted the patient however uh, if you um, uh, as I mentioned earlier uh, uh, put those liberals under cognitive load in some way you sort of remove some of their cognitive resources then they actually become just as likely um, to see the patient as irresponsible um, so they uh, uh, are just as likely as conservatives to to make these internal attributions about the character the personality of the uh, of the, the the AIDS patients um, so you know thought that was a pretty interesting and uh, perhaps timely example. Uh, you can uh, you can sort of <laughs> extrapolate what that might mean for other kind of modern political uh, scenarios. Um, so, uh, just one final topic on this uh, uh, topic. Uh, uh, one final note on this topic. Um, obviously, like this is a really complicated, complex topic, and we just kind of like scratched the surface a little bit. Uh, there's a little bit more information in the text, but I didn't want to overdo it. Um, so I'm just trying to hit like the major principles to give you an idea of what this field of study is like. Um, but like, it's obviously a major area of interest for social psychologists. Um, and this is because it's uh, really important and relevant to a really wide range of behaviors. Uh, it's also because it's difficult and complicated to, to study and to understand. Um, the true, like the true causes of behavior are way more complicated than like a single factor, be it internal or external. Um, and our attributions are probably often much more complicated than that as well. Like, you know, our attributions are probably multifaceted and, and, uh, multifactored, right? Uh, the, and the, the true intentions that people have, uh, and the, the attributions that we're making are likely ambiguous. We might not even have access to them as an individual. Like I might not even know what attributions I'm making of other people, uh, as behavior. I might, I might not be conscious of it. I might not even be conscious of my own intentions. Right. Um, so like, this is an incredibly difficult topic to even approach, but that's part of what makes it so enticing, I think, for a lot of social psychologists. Um, and the other thing to note about this topic is that there's probably a good reason that we have such a strong predisposition towards making these internal attributions. Um, you know, as I've said many times now, generally humans want to see the world as like certain and consistent and just and fair. And when you make internal attributions, it helps to accomplish all of these goals. Like it, it helps us to believe that people are going to act similarly and consistently across situations and across time. Uh, and it helps us to think that we can model and predict and understand the world better, uh, even though that's not necessarily true. Um, it, it helps us to think that the world is just, right? Like people get what they deserve um, when things happen to them. If it's a good thing, it's because the person was good in some way, is, is good. Uh, and when bad things happen to a person, it's because that person is bad in some way. Way. Um, and this, this belief, uh, is, is referred to as belief in a just world. Um, the idea that people get what they deserve and, and good things happen to good people in the world is ultimately a just and fair place. Um, this is a trait that's studied in personality psychology. You don't need to worry about it for this course necessarily. Um, and you know, obviously we don't, all believe all of this all of the time it's just a it's kind of a pattern in humans to trend towards believing this um so yeah just just a few sort of like final tangential almost notes there uh that i just wanted to squeeze in um okay let's let's move on okay so uh speaking of making attributions of people's internal states, um, let's turn to uh, impression formation. And this is the process by which we represent people in our minds. We create an impression of other people in our, in our minds. 
Um, and this process begins uh, uh, relatively quickly um, and with little effort. So uh, like within seconds of uh, seeing a person, uh, we automatically assess their gender, uh, their age, um, whether someone uh, could be related to us. And this includes a variety of things like uh, group membership of, of many types, um, their race, uh, their religion, et cetera, the, you know, a variety of things. Um, uh, indicators of their health, uh, uh, and, uh, even more. Um, so, uh, some people have speculated that this, this process of uh, automatically almost instantaneously assessing all these factors, um, was developed, uh, by humans in order to encourage survival basically, or, or survival and, um, biological fitness, right? Uh, we need to immediately assess people for their potential as mates, can you know can they help me survive and uh increase or ensure my biological fitness um and uh it, barring that are they a threat in some way uh do they have potential to uh, uh harm me or my loved ones in some way um so all these judgments that i've just mentioned uh are meant to evaluate people on these two categories um just a quick addendum uh i just realized i said biological fitness without uh, defining it you might have encountered this term already but biological fitness is the idea that you need to ensure your genetic uh, uh presence in the world by having children that are genetically related to you it's a fundamental idea in uh, uh evolutionary psychology evolution natural selection what have you um it's also debatable in some ways but let's not worry about that for now <laughs> um so uh, after about 30 seconds, um, we can even make uh, decently accurate assessments of, uh, of people's personality. Um, so for example, there's this one study that um, they showed the subjects in the study 30 seconds of a video of a lecturer. Um, and uh, the subjects who watched that video assessed the lecturer in a similar way to the students who were actually in the course after an entire semester, meaning that um, <laughs> uh, with about 30 seconds, um, the, 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 the subjects in the study were able to pretty much figure out what the, um, students, um, who had an entire semester with this person, um, figured out. So having more than 30 seconds doesn't even seem to increase accuracy all that much. Um, which means that, you know, hopefully by now you've formed a positive impression of me and my lecturing ability or, um, perhaps you formed a negative one and seemingly in either case you're likely to be accurate so uh, let's hope it was a positive one um, so uh, impression formation consists of two separate uh, strategies um, the first is bottom up and this is what I've been describing so far um, this is the process of gaining little pieces of information even if it's just minimal information like facial expression clothing body position movement personal space, whatever, taking all these little bits of information and then combining it all to synthesize an understanding of someone's personality. You're moving from the bottom, all the little bits up, um, bottom up. Um, so if bottom up is taking information, uh, and using it to create a sort of a macro high level understanding, um, you can probably guess what top down is top down is where you start uh, with that um, macro high level uh, understanding and you use it to understand or infer the person's various attributes like the ones that I just listed facial expression clothing so on um, so you have these preconceived notions and you use those to form an understanding of the person um, and uh, I'll just quickly mention that bottom up and top down are a very common sort of pair of meta concepts in psychology um, you'll encounter them uh, repeatedly um, so you know if you if you need to like google them or something to kind of gain a tight understanding of them it might be worthwhile at some point you're going to keep seeing these terms so um one top-down tendency for example uh, is what's called false consensus uh so this is the tendency that we have to assume that the world is broadly like us um others must share our attitudes our opinions our pref preferences um especially uh people in our in group so uh for example um young torontonians um 
maybe uh, we assume that other young Torontonians have to be left wing um, because we're left wing and everyone we know is left wing, right? We, we assume that other people have to be kind of like us in this way. And then if we meet a young Torontonio who is uh, conservative or, you know, a right winger, um, it's probably often a shock to us lefties, right? Um, and another top-down tendency is what's called the halo effect. Um, so this is the uh, tendency for evaluations um, on a specific aspect of a person to be biased by your general uh, impression of that person. So for example, if you see someone, you uh, immediately think that they're attractive, you're actually more likely to rate them as uh, intelligent as well. Um, you're, you're sort of taking that general positive impression, they're attractive, and you're applying it to a specific aspect of that person, they're intelligent. Uh, and the opposite is also true, whereby if you think that someone is unattractive, you're less likely to rate them as intelligent. Um, and then uh, one final uh, top-down impression formation um, strategy is stereotyping. So uh, you guys are all probably familiar with this, at least in the lay uh, sense of the word. And you know, the psychological definition is pretty close to the lay definition. This is basically a shortcut that we take um, where uh, we take the schema for a group and then we strictly apply it to an individual member of a group. Um, so this could be something simple, like assuming uh, meeting a hockey player and assuming you know that he doesn't read in his spare time. Uh, but that's a boring and unimportant example. The important, impactful, interesting applications um, have to do with applying stereotypes to ethnic groups, to certain sexualities, to certain genders, these sorts of things, right? Um, this is an extremely important topic, uh, and it'll be covered in greater detail in a full chapter later in the semester. So I won't belabor it right now, especially because we will actually have a guest lecturer, we think, um, in to talk about that, and, and she'll have a sort of a, a more detailed and, and um, sort of personally informed she, she studies this sort of thing right so um, she, she can speak to it in, in probably better detail than I can um, but I will say that uh, uh, the the better we get to know a person the more we individuate them the more we see them as an individual and then the less that we rely on stereotypes um, as well like if we're motivated to understand a person and to get to know them we we do rely less on social groups and and other forms of top down uh top down impression formation um so this is more likely to happen if we're like working together uh with someone towards the same goal like you you work together at a you know a job or or you know like a group for a class or something um or if you have a shared interest with that person or a shared group with that person um so you know just to return to the uh the, the hockey player maybe i assume like he's dumb and a jock and he only does boring stuff and he's mean and he only likes to party blah, whatever right uh this sort of like the, the popular media portrayal of like sports jocks um but you know maybe one day at lunch i see him playing like a tabletop role-playing game and then I realize that we have a shared interest and, I f and I'll be more motivated to see him as an individual and to form an impression using more bottom-up techniques and relying less on stereotyping. Okay. So uh, just to recap a little bit, um, <clears throat> what we talked about today was uh, the idea of memory as a reconstructive process um, and how we use schemata to uh, uh, understand uh, our, our memories, to understand the past information and experiences. Next, we talked about how we tend to uh, see the behavior of others as being indications of that person's self, their traits, desires, beliefs, whatever. Um, and then finally, we talked a little bit about how we come to understand one another through uh, the, the process of impression formation, um, which uh, consists of both bottom-up and top-down processes. Um, so yeah, uh, the, you know, this has been our sort of like blast of social cognition. Um, as I mentioned before, this is like a huge, very important topic. Um, like you could you you really could like people spend their careers on social cognition right so um we kind of just did a whirlwind tour of it hopefully you found it interesting hopefully you found some bits in there that uh, uh kind of excite you and um you know hopefully i did uh, uh 
uh, enough to kind of like spike your interest in this topic. Um, but yeah, the, the textbook has a little bit more information. And if you're really interested, you should look at volunteering as a research assistant in one of the labs in our uh, social psychology uh, uh, area uh, here at York. You know, we have some excellent researchers who focus on social, social cognition and uh, you probably have a great time in their lab. Um, so that's the end of the lecture. Um, so we'll just um, do a couple of quick media recommendations. Uh, and then that'll be it for for this lecture. Um, so the first recommendation is uh, the movie Rashomon. This is a 1950 film by the um, Japanese director Akira Kurosawa, one of the uh, probably best known Japanese directors. And uh, Rashomon is considered one of the best films of all time by many people. Um, this is a movie about a... Uh, uh, a, a host of people remembering the same event differently. So as you can see, very relevant to our, uh, to our material today. Um, the next recommendation is the novel A Scanner Darkly uh, by Philip K. Dick. There's also a movie, and the movie's pretty good. Uh, I'd recommend the book, but both are worth checking out, maybe. Um, this is a movie about uh, perception and subjectivity, and uh, or sorry, book, I should say, uh, about perception and subjectivity and... Um, trying not to say too much without spoiling it you know what check it out it's uh really cool and weird like most of philip k dick's uh, work um and then my final recommendation is a uh, video game called the witness um this is a really excellent puzzle game um it's extremely difficult but it's very rewarding if you figure it out um it's basically uh, a game where you explore this island you can see in the image um and you complete these uh dot grid puzzle tasks um and this game was um uh, extensively uh, play tested uh, and is sort of designed based on principles of um, human perception, human meaning making, pattern building, um, uh, um, human learning tendencies. Uh, it, it was obsessively designed and it really shows. It's a, it's like a magnificent kind of like masterpiece of a game. So if you like tough puzzle games, definitely check it out. Okay, hope you found that interesting. If not, that's okay too. Um, uh, I'll see you all next week.